we as a church are in this journey right now dealing with spiritual warfare. We're in this journey as a result of the previous sermon series regarding revival. We were talking about the fact that we are a people who are desperately in need of revival. We need a touch from the Lord God. And the reality is, is it doesn't make a difference whether it's First Baptist Church of Bowling Green, whether it's First Christian, whether it's the Assemblies of God, whether it's another church in this country. The only hope that we actually have is an encounter with the Lord God. We are in desperate need of it. The church is in such a state at this point where we are not even meeting the growth of communities. The growth around us is happening at such a, uh, such a rate that we're not even touching it, which says that the church is actually becoming in many ways ineffectual. And it's in this ineffectiveness that we see the rise of the nuns. And when I say nuns, I'm not talking about Catholic nuns with, with uh, habits on. I'm talking about the nuns as in N-O-N-E-S, those who have no religious affiliation whatsoever, where they sit there and say, what is the purpose of church? Why should I even attend a worship service? What value do I have in the local church? Many people are asking that very question in our world today. And in fact, some of you here today may be here because you were forced to be here or somebody coerced you to be here. And you may be asking the very same question yourself. What's the purpose? Why? Why am I in church? And my, re, my premise is that, the, that until you have been touched by the Savior, you're going to continually ask that question. And until a redemptive revival type fire comes down, grabs hold of your heart, you are going to constantly be in that state where you're sitting there going, why should I go to church? But I will tell you that if you ever get touched by the master, if he ever comes in and impacts your life and grabs hold of you, Junior, you're never going to let it go, will you? Just thinking about that, what, what he always says over there. Junior always says, I got saved, and I, and I never got over it. When we receive Christ, and it really has impacted us, and we know the Savior, and he knows us, and we are his, and he is ours, we don't let it go. And that is the desperate reality of the world we live in. And so we were talking about this revival necessity and need for God to fall upon us corporately here at First Baptist Church of Bowling Green. And then it was out of that sermon series on revival that we entered into this sermon series about spiritual warfare. Because one of the things I said to you all was the fact that if we will humble ourselves, if we will humble ourselves before this mighty and righteous God, and we will start praying with fervency and intensity and a longing to have an encounter with him. If we will start living life that way, praying that way, the adversary will be angry. He will not be pleased. Quite frankly, the adversary is okay with churches growing numerically as long as the people are not growing spiritually. He is absolutely content as long as we are not impacting a lost world in need of a Savior. He is perfectly fine with numbers being at a level where we're going, oh, isn't it good for us to be in the house of the Lord? But yet really never encountering him and having him impact us. But as soon as we start to change our focus, as soon as we start to change our direction, and we sit here and say, oh, Lord God, I need you to affect the way that I touch lost people in this world. I, I need you to impact the way that I work in my place of business for the sake and name of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, I don't know if you realize that you have your job because you are an ambassador of Jesus Christ sent to that place to share the love of Jesus in that place. For many of us, all we see are places of employment as nothing more than our place where we receive a paycheck to take care of our earthly needs and goods. No, you are there by the appointment and assignment of God. 
And that's the place you spend most of your working life or most of your life is in these places of employment. And yet for so many of us, we just sit on our hands, do our job, and then we never say anything about the love of Jesus Christ. That is where you are called to be the most evangelistic. And then in your family and your neighbors and everywhere else you are going. And so we're at talking about this reality of saying, okay, God, I surrender myself to you. Then if that is what we begin to do, the adversary is going to rise up and he is going to begin attacking you. So we began this study saying, recognize there is a spiritual battle going on. That spiritual battle is not against people. We talked about that last week. Our battle is not against flesh and blood. Our battle is against the powers and the principalities, the rulers of this dark world, Satan and his demonic horde. That is the enemy. He might use people. He might manipulate people. He might stir on people. But they are not your enemy. These are people that Jesus Christ died for. He loves them. And he wants you to display the love of Christ to them. And so how do we do that when we know we're in the midst of, 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 of a warfare? How do we do it? Well, Paul then begins to take us into this journey where he's saying, put on God, who is your armor. And he then proceeds to give us this imagery, this, this picture of this warrior of one who has shield and sword, who has helmets and breastplates. This is the picture he starts to build for us. And I don't think that Paul was accidental in what he assigned to each one of those pieces of armor. I think he was intentional. I think he was deliberate. I think that while he is in that prison cell, excuse me, while he's in that prison cell writing this letter, chained next to this soldier of Rome, and he's looking at him, he's sitting there going, wow, the Holy Spirit has just pricked my heart and just given me a visual description of the way that God protects us and starts to write it out. And so over these next several weeks, we are going to unpack each one of these elements. And the very first one is the belt of truth. Now, if you will, let's look at the actual passage. This is Ephesians chapter 6, verse 14. If you don't have a Bible with you, there's a, pew by, a Bible in the pew back in front of you. You can grab it, turn to page 153 in the New Testament, and you'll be right there where we are. And if you do not have a Bible, please take that home with you as a gift from us because we want people reading the word. And in the context of this sermon, knowing the truth, because there is a truth, and the truth is found in these words. And so let us go to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 14. Let's read the very first part. It says this, Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth. And it's this phrase, having girded your loins with truth. The NIV says it, it's, it's put on the belt of truth. This is the part of the armor that you see down here, but just above the knees that goes up. Now, this particular rendition of a Roman soldier shows him wearing a, a, a cloth garment too. But in many cases, there would be um, some um, protective elements right over his reproductive organs here. And this is where you would see this, and it would also be to protect his inner thighs and his, and his thighs as well. And so it would come to here to about here, and it's girded around his loins, around his waist. He buckles it like a belt. And this is where this part of the armor is. And so Paul tells us that this is the first thing. You know, if we are standing firm in the reality, like we looked at last week, that we take ground and we stand firm. We take more ground and we stand firm. We never go backwards in the body of Christ. We are always taking ground. 
And when we take more ground, we stand firm in that ground. And now he's telling us, okay, therefore, having stood firm, gird yourself, the Lord's the truth. And this is where we're going to look at. So let's pray and then let's unpack this concept of truth. Father, we need you desperately this day. Father, there is a truth in this world. And this truth is found in your son, Jesus. And we need to know him. We need to know the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. So, Father, over these next couple of moments, as we look at this particular passage, I pray that you would strengthen our hearts, that you would convict our hearts, that you would help us to understand the issues of truth. Father, you are the only one who can truly impact us, move in our midst, stir us to your great grace and truth. So, Father, over these next couple of moments, help us to understand truth. Help us to know you and the fullness thereof. Oh, God, we humble ourselves before you. Lord, be glorified. Let your spirit have reign and rule in this place. Whatever it is that we may be bearing or, or, or carrying in at this point, may we lay it at your feet. May we say to you, Lord God, speak to us and speak truth in my life. Touch us, God. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So he's telling us to put on this belt of truth, gird ourselves in the loins with truth. So what exactly is truth? I, it's the very question that I think has haunted humanity from its inception. This is the very question that Pilate asked Jesus before he was crucified. Pilate actually says, what is truth? We, we live in a world today where relativism is the rule of the day. In other words, what is truth for me is truth for me. And what is truth for you is truth for you. Whatever you want to believe is fine. Whatever I want to believe is fine. That's what the world tells us. It's relative. It's relative to my position. It's relative to what I want to believe. I mean, think about it. Right now, we're living in a world where we have what's now known as fake news. I'm not even certain what that even means. But it's because news is relative. It's from whatever perspective you are looking at it from. What lens do you have on? That determines what is truth. I mean, for example, today. Today is Sanctity of Life Sunday. It's the Sunday in which in Sunday school you, you had a lesson, I hope, that depicted and declared the value of life. If you were not in Sunday school, let me wag my finger at you. You need to be in Sunday school. The closeness of your relationship with the body of Christ is going to be found in Sunday school, not in a corporate gathering like this. It's in Sunday school that we open up the Word of God and we dig into these truths and find out what is truth. Because the truth is in this Word. And Sunday school is the best place to unpack those things. So if you're here in our midst and you're not a member of Sunday school, let me tell you, you need to be. Join a small group. If you don't know what small group you're supposed to be a part of, don't come talk to me today. Call the church office or ask somebody around you. They'll be able to direct you. Okay? But you need to be involved in small groups. And it's in those small groups that your relationships get cultivated, your depth of your insight grows. It's where you start to know truth. But why I mentioned Sunday school is because it's Sanctity of Life Sunday. But we live in a world where we argue over when life begins. And this is the reason why we have the country that has the largest number of abortions in the world. 
we've killed more babies than all of our wars combined, if I'm not mistaken, by the most recent statistics. Why? Because we have a dif di di differing opinion as to what is life. <laughs> the Bible's pretty clear. Life happens at conception. That's truth. And therefore, we hold to this truth that at the conception, that life begins. And we hold it dear, we hold it precious, and we value it. And that's why we have a day like today, Sanctity of Life Sunday. But yet we have a group of people in this world who would say otherwise. No, 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 life doesn't happen until the baby's actually birthed. That's just craziness. Up to that point, it's just tissue, organisms, atoms and cells. But what is truth? And how do we get to it? Well, that is the purpose of today. When the Bible, we are told of specific evidence of this, and so it's your first point. Your first point this morning is this, is the truth sets us free. The truth sets us free. And you can write these down. The words will be on the screen. But if you turn to John chapter 8, Verse 31 and 32, we hear these words of Jesus being spoken to us. He says, so Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. And you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. Now we have gone in depth as to what this means in other sermons, but I'm going to briefly recap it. He says, look, he says, if you continue in my word, then you are truly my, truly disciples of mine. And this word disciple, it's, it's Talmud. And this is, this is this issue of us who are followers of our rabbi. And the whole premise of a Talmud in the time of Jesus is that whatever the rabbi does, his Talmud can do. The reason the rabbi chooses his disciples is because he sees in them, this is one who has the potential to do what I do. This is the whole reason why the story of Jesus and Peter and Peter walking on the water is so significant. It's because when they see Jesus walking on the water and they think he's a ghost and then they find out it's him, Jesus, I mean, Peter says to him, if it's really you, tell me to come out onto the water and I will. Because what Peter is doing is he is demonstrating the fact that as a disciple of this one, he has called me to do what he does. And so Jesus says, it is I come. And so Peter gets out of the water and starts to walk. And we don't know how long he walks, but then we know the story. Waves come on him. He takes his eyes off of Jesus and he begins to sink. At which point Jesus picks him up. As I've shared with you, I think he pulls him close to him and says, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? I don't think he scolds him. I don't think this is a, is a, like a, a verbal lamb blasting of him in, in an assaultive way. I think rather what you have going on, for some reason I rumble more over here, so I'm going to come back. But what I think you really see going on here is you have Jesus sitting here basically saying to him, you are doing it. As long as you keep your eyes on me, you're able to do what Talmud did do, which is following me. Strengthen, be strengthened, Peter, in this. And so what we see here in this particular words of Jesus is Jesus saying, look, if, if you continue in my words, in my word, in my words, in the things that I'm teaching you, then you're truly my disciples. In other words, if you do what I say you can do, then you're really mine. And then he goes on and he says that next phrase. And then, and then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. So how do we know what truth is? We know truth by spending time with the master, with the rabbi of our faith, Jesus Christ. So how do you do this? Well, this is what the word is all about. This is what you're personal quiet times are about. This is what your worship throughout the day is about. This is what your prayer life is about. There's all these components involved 
but every bit of what we do is to draw us into a relationship with Jesus so that the closer we are with him, the easier it is for us to hear his voice. So, Chris and I have been married 23 years, right? Some of you all have been married a lot longer than that. In fact, Cohen and Claudine just celebrated uh, 60 years. Was it not all right? All right, just last week, 60 years. Here's my point. Do you think Claudine and Cohen know each other better than, say, Christy and I do at 23 years? I certainly hope so. I certainly hope so. I hope that those two have such a relationship with each other that they don't even have to say words sometimes. They just got to look at each other and they know what they're thinking. And I bet that happens. A situation will be coming around, something will be done, something will be said. They look at each other and they know what they know. Because that's already happening with me and Christy at 23 years. Now, do you think that was happening with me and Christy at year one? Oh, great day in the morning. We fought about everything. We fought about toothpaste. That was our biggest marital fight the first year was toothpaste. And I was too stupid to realize, you know, it's a simple fix. Just buy two. <laughs> That's how dumb I was. You'd laugh. Look, I'm on the side note here, but you don't grab toothpaste from the middle. Okay? You grab I'm probably causing marital fights right now. You grab toothpaste from the end and you slide it down. Okay? You don't just grab it. But I'm too stupid to realize, hey, just buy two. Let her squeeze it in the middle all she wants. So we fought about that all the time. Then all of a sudden, I don't have to wait. I can just get another one. This is what I'm talking about. We grow in the relationship. The more time you spend with Jesus, the more you understand him, and then you start to cultivate his characteristics in your life. Look, I have very little mercy, but I have more mercy now because of Christie's life impact on me. I used to be incredibly hard and harsh. Some of you think, there ain't no way you're still mean. Well, maybe so. Should have known me 23 years ago. On our wedding day, Christy's bridesmaid and second bridesmaid come up to her and said, you know it's not too late. He's, he's a jerk. You don't have to marry him. You know that. Day of our wedding, did it not happen? Truly. Now, years later, those same ladies came to her and said, look, you saw something we didn't see. He really is a good guy for you. But that wasn't how it started. But Christy has made me a better man than I was. You see? And this is what Jesus does in us. The more time that we spend with him, the more we become his disciple, the more his life, his truth begins to impact us. And then we start to see the truth of the situations in this world. And that truth is liberating. And it really does set us free. You understand? Okay, so this is the first point. The truth sets us free. But then we see a second truth, because this is even more important. We see the truth of the Savior. This is your second point this morning. The truth of the Savior. And it's found in John 14, 6. Now, this is a, this is a verse that we use all the time at funerals. And it's a great verse for funerals. Because... What you have going on in John chapter 14 is, is Jesus talking to the disciples and then and saying, look, I'm, I'm getting ready to leave. I'm getting ready to go away. But when I go away, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And then I'm going to come back and I, I'm going to bring you to me. And then that's when Philip and all of his theological brilliance says, where are you going? And how are we going to find it? And Jesus is like, Philip, if I've been with you for so long that you, that you don't know me kind of stuff. And then he goes in and he says these words. And this is where you get 14, verse 6, where Jesus said to him, talking about Philip, but also to the rest. 
But Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Beloved, you need to understand that truth is not an idea or a concept. It's not an intellectual assent. Truth is a person. And the person is Jesus. All things that are true are found in Jesus. And when Jesus starts this, this is one of the few, I mean, one of the, the numerous passages in John where we see him pointing himself back to the Old Testament, to the covenantial name of God. All throughout the book of John, what you see Jesus doing, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the gate. I am the good shepherd. I am the bread of life. I am all these things, the resurrection and the life. When Jesus is saying these I am statements, he is direct, directly telling the people, I am God. I am the covenantal God of the Old Testament. I am the God who is the one who brought Egypt, I mean Israel, out of Egypt. I am the one who established you in this promised land. I am the one who ordained the kings and brought you David. I am the messianic hope of the line of David. I am God in flesh, incarnate, dwelling among you. And I am telling you there's only one way to heaven, and it is through me. So truth is a person, and it is very narrow. This is the reason the world has such a problem with Christians. It's because in the world, we say whatever you want to believe is okay. But Jesus says narrow is the way that leads to life. And few there are that find him. And broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many there are that go that way. There is a narrowness of salvation. And that narrowness is down to a singular person. Jesus Christ either is who he said he is or he is not. But if indeed he is who he says he is and he is and he is Lord, if that is the reality, then he determines how you live in this world. He, excuse me, he is the standard of truth because he is truth. And you no longer are able or given the, 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 the simplicity, if you will, or even the excuse, if you will, to be able to say, yes, but I live life better than so and such. You can no longer have the privilege to be able to compare your life to another person's standard of living. There's only one standard by which you compare your life now, and it is the standard of Christ. And his commands are, quite frankly, hard. Even though he tells you, look, come to me, take my yoke upon you, for my way is easy and my burden is light. Yes, that is a reality. But at the exact same time, when you get to Luke chapter 9, he sits there and says, you better count the cost. Because, yes, I relieve pain and I relieve suffering and I remove all these things and I give you a supernatural peace. But he also tells us in his very first sermon in Matthew chapter 5 that blessed are those who are persecuted for my name's sake. Because Jesus understands that in this world they hated him. And if they hated him, they're going to hate us. And the reason they're going to hate us is because our standard is narrow. But our standard is truth. So what do you stand on? What is the foundation? by which you live your life. If it is anything other than Jesus, you're standing on the wrong thing. And you need to repent. And in just a few moments, we're going to have the deacons down here, and you can come, and you can pray with one of them, you can come to these steps that we call altars, but you need to get it right with the Lord God if you are standing on anything other than the Savior. It is about Him and Him alone. It is about the standard of truth, and He is the truth. 
truth is a person. And this person is the one that sets us free. Which then leads us into this final point. So we see the truth sets us free, and we see that truth of the Savior, but then we also see the truth of our mission. The truth of our mission. Now remember, Paul is locked up, chained next to a Roman guard, and he's looking at this armor. And he looks at this armor and he says, well, what does that protect? And I've already alluded to it earlier, but it protects this, this military man's reproductive organs. And I would challenge you and tell you that your mission is nothing more than reproduction. So why do I say that? Because the last words that Jesus said to us on this earth, and all four Gospels have a version of it. When we start the book of Acts, we see it found there also, but we see this commissioning of Jesus to us, his last words while on this earth, telling us, go. So let's look at those words again. It's Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. The words will be on the screen again. It says, And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. You have been commissioned by truth to make truth makers. You have been commissioned by Jesus Christ himself that if you are indeed born again, that you are supposed to be telling people about him. That is your call. So you have to ask yourself at this very moment, if you are indeed his, when was the last time that you actually had the opportunity and grace to share the love of Jesus Christ with the person, that they prayed and repented, received Christ Jesus as their Lord and Savior, and then you came alongside of them and discipled them into the ways of the truth. So they themselves would become reproducing disciple makers. Because I'm going to just tell you, you're not a reproducing disciple maker until you've got at least two generations behind the first one, passing it on. In other words, showing, look, there is this reproduction happening. Paul looks at this soldier and says, there's a reason for that piece of armor. And I'm going to tell you, you can't start to reproduce until you get to the level of what is truth. Because truth is a person, and it is Jesus Christ. And it does set you free. It sets you free from all the stuff of this world. It sets you free from all the confusion of this world. It sets you free from all the baggage of this world. It sets you free from everything that you might be facing because he is the one who is the healer and the deliverer of your sin and your hurt. And he's the one that comes in and he is the rescuer. He takes you from the miry muck, from the pit of despair. He picks you up. He puts you on a solid ground. He becomes your anchor in the storm. And he is the truth. And he then says, if you really are mine, then your desire ought to be to let everybody know about me. So you have to ask yourself this morning. You have to do a heart check. You have to do a gut check. You have to sit there and say, God, am I actually living life completely and utterly sold out to your mission, which is the proclamation of his great name? Because you desire for all people to know the truth person Jesus that will indeed set them free. In a moment, I'm going to ask the deacons to come down. And maybe you're sitting here this day, and you're going, you know what? I've never encountered the truth. I've never met Jesus. This revival stuff you're talking about and this encounter with Jesus, I don't know anything about it. But you can know today. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. You can come down Right now, speak to one of these deacons, and they would love to share with you how you can know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Deacons, come on down as I'm, as I'm talking. And you can surrender your life 
to the Lord God today. Just humble yourself before him. Maybe you're sitting here today and you, and you are a follower of Jesus, but for whatever reason, you have not been pursuing intimacy with him. You've not been pursuing to know him and the depths of his truth. But you can come to these altars, you can pray, you can confess it. And you can just lay it down before the Father and sit there and say, God, I want to get restored back to a right relationship with you. Because I want to experience revival presence. I want to experience revival power. I want to experience the fullness of your power of resurrection. But let me just warn you, that will also lead for you to know the fellowship of his suffering. But it will be far worth it. Whatever it is you experience in the negative will be far worth it for the surpassing greatness of the knowledge you have in Jesus Christ. So whatever the cost, it is worth it. But you need to count that cost. And then come and pray and say, Lord God, let's get it right. I challenge you to do so today. Maybe you've been attending this church for a while, and you know that you're supposed to be joining this body of believers. You can come down and talk to one of these deacons. They'll fill out a little card, get your information, and I'll follow up with you. And then you can join our church and say, look, I want to partner with that body of believers. You may not have it right. They don't get everything perfect. But you know what? They're striving truly to be Christ-centered, gospel-driven, joyfully united, and prayerfully obedient. And you need to join with us because the Holy Spirit's been telling you to do so. Maybe there's something else the Spirit's speaking your heart about. I would challenge you. Listen to the truth and obey Him. Let me pray as our musicians come. Father, you are indeed glorious. You are indeed good. You are indeed our hope. You are our salvation. You are our life. You are our light. You really are this great I am. You are this God who comes in and meets us covenantially and takes us from our despair and brings us into this glorious light of love. Father, may we indeed know you this morning as we ask for revival fires to fall upon us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.